Easter Sunday, I like to share the funniest joke of all time, funniest joke you've ever heard. I'm preempting and telling you it's a joke because on Friday, I actually shared a joke and I don't think people realised it was actually really funny. And so they just sat there staring at me. I, I laughed, but so maybe we're getting to that stage now, familiarity where I need to tell you uh, uh, this one's a joke, all right? So get ready to laugh. So I want to share with you my favourite Easter joke. It goes like this. And again, please, I'm not, I'm not, don't anyone read into this and think I'm having a go at anyone, I'm not, all right? You've got to always preface that these days. A man and his ever-nagging wife went on vacation to Jerusalem. While they were there, the wife passed away. The undertaker told the husband, you can have her shipped home for $5,000, or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150. The man thought about it and told him he would just have her shipped home. The undertaker asked, why would you spend 5000 to ship your wife home when it would be wonderful to be buried here and you'd spend only $150? The man replied, long ago, a man died here, was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't afford to take that chance. That's a great gag, and it never gets old. I'm going I'm, I'm to continue to share that every Sunday. Um, hey, welcome to church this morning. Uh, if there's any visitors here, nice to have you with us today. Uh, Easter Sunday, what a great morning. Uh, a little bit different to Easter Friday, and I'm going to get to that in a second. It's a great day to be in church. This is probably the most significant church day on the calendar for the church period worldwide. Um, the birth of Jesus is amazing. Christmas is great. We all get our gifts and so on. But the birth of Jesus was not necessarily, uh, we know that it was a virgin birth, but uh, people can believe that Jesus Christ, a man called Jesus, was born 2,000 years ago. That's a believable story. They may not believe it the same way we do, but history tells us there was a man called Jesus Christ that walked the earth. At some point, he was born. Easter Friday, the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. There's a lot of evidence, not just biblical evidence, but there are writers that speak outside of the Bible, uh, historians and so on, that will talk about the crucifixion of this man called Jesus Christ. So again, that's something that's verifiable. It's something that's easy to believe. It's easy to believe that a man was born, amen? It's easy to believe that a man was crucified, that a man died. Easter Sunday, we uh, remember an event that's kind of almost unbelievable, and that is that Jesus Christ was not only crucified and buried, but three days later that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Amen? Jesus risen, uh, not like he's not in a tomb anymore. Uh, he's not on a cross. We have lots of depictions of Christ on a cross and jewelry and so on, which to the early church world would have been an amazing affront to them because the cross was not a symbol of hope. It was not a symbol of anything uh, beautiful or noteworthy. The cross was a symbol of barbaric torture in early days. So nowadays it has different symbolism, means something different to us. But Jesus Christ is not on that cross, even though he's depicted uh, often uh, in pictures and, and, and jewelry and things that he is. Uh, Jesus was on that cross, was taken down from that cross, and has never been back on a cross. There's never been another need for the Son of God to be sacrificed. There's never been a need for another sacrifice in the economy of God that would deal with sin like what took place on uh, Easter Friday all those years ago. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, 15, verse 14, I better put my glasses on. Paul writes this to the Corinthians. He says, if Christ has not been raised, he says our preaching is useless and so is your faith. If Christ was not raised from the dead, what I'm doing right now is an absolute waste of my time. I should be at home doing the landscaping in my backyard, which I'm six months behind doing. I should be doing that. It would be a better use of my time. Preaching is useless. But more to the point, your faith, what you believe, the way you see life as a Christian, your worldview, right, wrong, good, bad, evil, suffering, the way you see everything through the lens of your Christian faith is an absolute joke if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead. But we're here this morning to celebrate the fact that we believe and we know that Jesus Christ did indeed rise from the dead. Did you know that there are over 300 verses that speak of the resurrection of Jesus in this collection of ancient documents? Over 300 passages that speak of the resurrection. Did you know that even Jesus knew that death was not going to keep him down? He's recorded, Mark records him, Mark 9.31. Jesus said, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They'll kill him, and after three days, he will rise. Now, my theory is this. Any human being who can predict their own death, burial, and resurrection, and actually pull it off, 
you need to listen to everything that dude says. Amen? You need to listen to everything that comes out of his mouth. And Jesus knew what was coming down the track. Jesus knew that he would be crucified. But he also knew at the other end of that, there would be this beautiful uh, reconnection, re, uh, back into the presence of his father. He knew what was on the other side. Did you know that the religious leaders or the Romans in Jesus' time, they could have ended this movement called Christianity right at the start by simply producing a body. All they had to do was pull up a body and go, hang on, before this thing gets out of control, here's your dead, lifeless Messiah. But they didn't do that. They couldn't stop this movement that we're a part of in the early days because they didn't have a body, because Jesus Christ was indeed resurrected. You know, the disciples could have caved in under the pressure of this whole resurrection story, but they didn't. They could have said, hey, this is just a big hoax. Shame on us. Sorry that we led you all up the garden path. But these guys went on and were physically killed. They were murdered for their belief in one thing, and that was that Jesus Christ was resurrected. All they had to do was turn around and tell a little white lie and say to somebody, hey, not true, sorry, and deny what they'd seen. But they so believed in whatever it was that they experienced that they saw. They had so much faith and belief in it that it led them to the point of physical death because they would not deny the reality that they, with their own eyes, had seen this resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, what about the existence of the church today, 2,000 years after the resurrection? Millions and millions of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, all around the world, are doing what we're doing this morning, and they're gathering together, and they are remembering the fact that we don't serve a God who's still in a tomb. We don't serve a God hanging on a cross. We serve a resurrected Jesus this morning. And that's something, I think, to get excited about. It's something worth talking about. It's something worth thinking about. And it's something worth believing with all the evidence that goes behind it. Reminds me of a cartoon that I saw once. There were these two Roman soldiers that were standing beside the empty tomb. And one of them was looking really troubled by the fact that this tomb was empty. And the other one was just shrugging his shoulders and saying, don't worry about it, 100 years from now, who's going to remember? Well, we're here today because we still remember the story of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter who tries to destroy that story or take that story away. There's something powerful about that story. There's something so real about that, something so historically and supernaturally real about that, that we'll never be able to wipe the existence of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus from the record books. Probably without doubt, the greatest proof of the resurrected Jesus would be the lives of different people that are sitting here who've given their lives over to him. The transformation, the stories have changed, the things that Jesus and your faith in Jesus has got you through, the stuff you've had to face that you knew if I was facing this by myself without knowing the, the, the reality of the resurrected Jesus beside me through this, maybe I would not have made it through. Anybody relate to that? Maybe I wouldn't have come out the other end. Maybe I would have just pulled up stumps and just sat there in the middle of whatever it was and still be wallowing there 10, 20, 30, 100 years later. But because of our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ, it has got us through a lot of difficult times and seasons in our life. And I think the greatest uh, testimony to the reality of that resurrection is found in the lives of those individuals who have been transformed over the years by this message. Now, here we are, Easter Sunday. Now, Sunday puts Friday in its proper perspective. Dealing with sin was not the end game. Dealing with sin was not God's full stop. The plan is done, it's completed. Dealing with sin was not the end game. God didn't put a full stop there in the story. Friday ends with a comma. Sunday was always the goal. Sunday was always the goal. And resurrection was always meant to be the primary narrative of the story about God. The pinnacle of the story of God, the pinnacle of, of the Easter story, the pinnacle of the Bible is the resurrection, this moment of resurrection. Sometimes I think that as a church we're known probably more for the impact of sin or what we, what's bad about sin or the evils of sin, probably more so than we are about the fact that, hang on, we actually believe in a resurrected Jesus. Resurrection was always the main point of the story. Sometimes we get bogged down on sin. And Friday, Jesus Christ hung on a cross and died for sin. He made these statement, these three words. He said, it is finished. But it wasn't actually over. 
it wasn't actually over. And when we hear those words, it is finished, it's easy for us to go, well, let's just park right there. That's the moment where it all, that, that, that's the completion and the end of the story. And a lot of people do, they park there. And they think that the whole Christian thing, that the whole thing revolves around the issue of dealing with sin. And they don't realize that that was a comma, not a full stop. There's going to be something that's going to happen in three days' time called the resurrection, where Jesus is going to come back to life. And it's not just about dealing with sin. God just doesn't want to deal with your sin. God wants to give you resurrection life. God doesn't want you getting bogged down in sin. Guess what? Let me tell you something that you probably are very aware of. You're a sinner. And if you don't think that or you're not aware of that, I'm sorry to offend you, but you are a sinner. Even if you are born again and you've given your life to Jesus, I will guarantee you this. You still think things that aren't completely godly at times. You still do things that aren't totally godly at times. You do not, if I was to look at you and follow you around for 24 hours, I would not say, oh, Rod, you look so much like Jesus, I cannot tell the two of you apart. I wouldn't say that because I'm sure that I would see when, when Rod has that swing of the golf and he slices the ball, probably something may come out of him. I don't know, I wasn't there. But something may come out that evidences to me, you are not Jesus himself. You are not perfect. We're saved by grace. But God wants to come and he wants to give us resurrection life. He doesn't just want us to camp around the fact that we are sinners. The reason Jesus died was because we were sinners and sin was a problem. But on Friday, Jesus hangs on that cross and he uses this phrase. He says, it is finished. What he meant was, okay, everything that needs to be done to deal with sin is now completed. But it's not the end of the story. There's something more I want to do. I don't just want to deal with sin and have the church camp around sin. I'm going to deal with sin, get sin out of the way so that now I can give to humanity to you, bring back to planet Earth that which I always wanted. That was human beings who were living, not just existing. I want you to have life. I want you to have an abundant life. It's not going to be a perfect life. It's not going to be a pain-free life. It's not going to be everything you want, beer and Skittles, as they say. It's going to have some rough, bumpy patches. It's going to have some disappointment. It's going to have some pain. But still, it's going to be all walked out with God, knowing that God is with you. And knowing that one day when we do leave here, we will go on and have not just life, but we'll take that life into life eternal. And we will be with Jesus. As Jesus was resurrected, as death could not hold him down, death can't hold God's people down either. Jesus was not afraid of dying on the cross because he knew on the other side I'll be reconnected to my heavenly father. And here's the thing. The fear of death has been dealt with for us as well because if you are in this place and you know Jesus Christ, then guess what? You will not die. You will shed this tent, this body that you carry around. Yep, you might jump out of it at some point. But you're going to go on and you're going to live for eternity. Death has no fear. Death has no sting to us because we are going to live forever. And what I love about Sunday is that Sunday brings the story to its completion. It's not just about sin. As a matter of fact, if sin didn't stop us having life, God probably wouldn't have worried about it. But we know that it's sin that stopped us having the life God wants. So Jesus deals with sin not as the primary thing. The primary thing is let's get that out of the way because I want to give you life. I want you to have life. Isaiah 53 verse 5. Isaiah prophesying six to seven hundred years before Jesus came, speaking about uh, uh, Jesus and who he was in his death and what was going to happen supernaturally and spiritually and what transactions were taking place. He says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. It starts with transgressions and iniquities, but it ends with peace and healing. It starts with dealing with sin, but it ends with you and I getting life, wholeness, healing, God coming into our world and transforming us and changing us. Christianity is not just about sin. It's about life and life as God wants us to have it, an abundant life. That's the focus of our faith. And that's what we're reminded about on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. That just as Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again to newness of life, so we too 
can come out of that dead life that we had. Before I came to Jesus, I, 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 I tried things to try to fill that space in my life. You know, if, if, I, if, I, if you just get the pretty girl on your arm, if you just get the, 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 the car or the money or you win the, you know, sporting event or you, you, the, you know, everyone's laughing at your jokes. <laughs> Some things have changed. Once upon a time, I lived like that. There was always something that would... And, and, and you know, the, the, the thing is about life is that the truth is some of those things do fill those holes. But it's never permanent. It's never permanent. The relationship breaks up. The money runs out. The high disappears. The chemical wears off. The whatever, and, and you're left back just being who you are. Just you and your creator. So those things temporarily fill, but they don't fill permanently. They don't fill permanently. And I didn't have life. I existed before I came to Jesus, and I know that. I existed pretty good. I tried really hard to look like I had life, life of the party, and always laughing and telling jokes and smiling and afraid afraid to let anybody really see what was going on inside of me, the depression, the, the, the hopelessness that was floating around inside of me. Sin was, sin was a problem. But at the back end of dealing with my sin... Jesus has given me life. God has given me life. And God wants to give us life. He's pierced for our transgressions. He's crushed for our iniquities. Jesus, on Friday, he dealt with the sin issue. Sunday now is about the healing and the wholeness and the journey of going on and becoming all that he wants us to become. The gospel story is good news. It's good news, isn't it? It's good news. Good news is not just, hey, you're a dirty, filthy sinner and Jesus dealt with that. Hey, that's, that's, that's okay news, yeah, sin, and, and he dealt, that's good. But I'll tell you what really, really good news is, the person you are before you came to him, all that stuff, he can transform your heart, he can change your life. He can turn you into the person that when he fashioned you in your mother's womb, he had an image and an idea and said, this is what I want for this person, this is what I want your life to be like. And when you reconnect with him, he can begin that process of, of, of creating us and turning us back into the person he originally designed us to be. Before all the disappointments and the hurt and all the stuff that rubbed up against us in life that turned us into somebody that we were probably never meant to be in the first place. But Jesus can turn us back into, he wants to pour his spirit out upon us. He wants to lead us, guide us, love us, be a part of our everyday, be a part of our experiences, not just the spiritual highs, but the deepest of lows. He wants to be involved in that because he wants to lead us and take us on a journey towards healing and towards wholeness so that we can experience life abundantly. That's what Sunday reminds me of. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. It's a bit of an association with what happened on Friday. We were, we were buried with him. Paul's writing going, I want to tell you something that took place. And, and you weren't physically there, but I'm telling you spiritually, this is exactly what took place uh, all those years ago when Jesus was hanging on a cross. He says that, that, that he was crucified and, and, and you were, in, in one way, we were crucified with him. We were crucified with him. We were buried with him through baptism into death in order that. In other words, that wasn't the end game. There's something more. That had to happen so this could happen. Sin needed to be dealt with so that I could give you life. This has to precede this, is basically what he's saying. He says, we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may what? Live a new life. That's exciting. We are called to live a new life. What's the new life? Well, he's saying that new life is a life that is different to the one you lived before you were buried with him in baptism. That was one life that you had when you were apart from me. Now that you're connected with me, now that sin's been dealt with and we're doing life together, I want you to have a new life. I want you to walk in newness of life. Again, so many Christians are caught back on Friday. All we're worried about is sin. Our whole life is about sin management. Our whole life is about checking the boxes in, oh, did I fail today? Did I let God down today? Did I, did I, did I, did I? And, and, and we use that lens on everybody else too, don't we? Oh, that was, oh, he did that, he did what? Oh, she said what? Oh. And as much as we judge ourselves, we, we, we look through uh, that lens of sin at the rest of the world and we judge other people. We watch the news and we just all we see is the wickedness and everything's so evil and wicked and that's all sin. And, and we just live out of this lens of sin, sin, sin. God wants us to live out of resurrection life. He wants us to see the beauty in the world. He wants us to see the beauty in each other. 
He wants us to know that he dealt with the sin issue. If my sin doesn't stop me from being in a relationship with God now, why do you judge me for it? And why do you not want to have, you know? We do that. Certain people, I don't, oh, you're, you're too dirty for me. You're too dirty. No. You're too evil. You're too wicked. It's about resurrection life. The central issue of our faith is this resurrected God who then says, as what you saw happen to me, buried, crucified, uh, buried in the ground, raised to newness of life. That's exactly the pathway and the plan that I have for each of you here. Friday dealt with the sin issue, but Sunday is about resurrection, the opportunity to live a brand new life. That word in in the Greek, new, it literally means this. It means to make progress, to make due use of opportunities. In other words, God, God gives us new opportunities to walk with him. And as we take those opportunities, the, he gives us the opportunity to forgive our enemies. It's an opportunity. He doesn't make it, make it, but it's an opportunity. And as we take the opportunity to forgive our enemies, for example, we make a little bit of progress towards this new life that he wants for us. When we, as we, we love our enemies... As we, we, we deny the things in life that we, okay, look, we, we know that, I know that doing this is not the best for me and for my relationship with God. So as I say no to that, it, these opportunities where I, 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 I do what I know is right, each one of those opportunities takes me on this journey of progress towards this new life that God has for me, this resurrection life. And I don't have to do it all in my own strength. That's the beautiful thing about the resurrection. When Jesus was, was, was raised from the dead, it says he had about 40 days teaching his, his disciples stuff, but he said to them, I don't want you to do anything until I send the Spirit. I don't want you to run out there now, and now that you're saved, think it's all about you, and it's all your efforts. He said, no, no, no. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to come and fill you and to be in you, because I know even though I've died for your sins, even though I've dealt with the sin issue, I still know that you are still human, and I still know that you are going to need more than just yourself. So I'm going to fill you with my spirit. As Ezekiel what is it, 36, verse 26 and 27 says, I'll take out your heart of stone, I'll give you a heart of flesh, I'll take out your dead spirit and I'll give you a new spirit. And I'll place my spirit inside of you and I will cause you to walk in my ways. I'll give you this little bit of an inner compulsion to do what you know is right. I'll provide the, the, I'll put it in first gear for you. You've still got to go through second, third and so on. And you can still put your foot on the brake if you want, but, but I'm going to transform you from the inside out so that your natural compulsion now is more towards doing what you know is right as opposed to what it used to be, which was doing anything that was possibly wrong. It's a new life. It's new opportunities to walk in the things of God. God gives us the opportunity for a fresh start. He gives us the chance to hit the reset button. You know, I wonder, it, it's such an amazing thought, isn't it, that the God of the universe... See, see, we we sometimes think Jesus hanging on a cross, how angry God must have been with all of us in that moment, looking at his sinless son, looking at the rest of us and going, this is all your fault. Some people, sometimes we can have this image of God. But yet John 3.16 tells us that God did it because he loved us. He wasn't looking at us and seeing his son suffering, going, you suckers, it's all your fault, I'm so mad at you, or look what I have to go through, look what my son has to go through because of you. He wasn't saying that. He was looking around with love in his eyes at us going, hey, Look at what I'm doing because I love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish. You'll have everlasting life. There's that life word again. It seems to me very clearly that God wants us to have this thing called life. He wants us to enjoy this thing called life, to walk in this thing called newness of life and not get bogged down in the sin stuff. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as sin and I'm not saying it's a free-for-all. But here's the thing, I, I, I did a, 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 what do you call it, a um, defensive driving course many years ago, right? And it was a, a Formula One guy that was running the course. And, and he made a statement I never forgot it. He said, when people come off the, off the road in their car, for example, and they're heading towards a tree, he said, what happens is, straight away, they look at the thing that they don't want to hit. And he said, but the reality is, whatever you're looking at, that's what you'll hit. So he trains us, he trained us and trains people. He says, when you, if you start sliding off the road, he says, don't look at where you're heading, look at where you should be going. He said, if you get your eyes back on the road, he said, well, then what will happen is you'll start to correct yourself. Because the principle is, he said, whatever you're looking at, that's what you'll hit. And I thought, wow, that's a great life principle, isn't it? Okay? 
speaking on YWAM, Youth with the Mission Schools, for, for many, many years. And it's amazing how many uh, young people will give me this story. They'll say, you know, I, I, I grew up my whole life saying I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want to be like my mum. I spend their whole life looking at what they don't want to be like. And guess what? They turned into it. Why? Because whatever you're looking at, you'll hit. I want to look at this resurrection life. I want to look at life. I want to look at what Jesus wants to give me. I, want to look at, I don't want to spend my whole life just looking at sin like that's the central point of the story of Christianity, when the central point is the resurrection. Uh, there's several times that Jesus spoke about uh, uh, his own death, burial, resurrection. That's the words that he used. He said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, 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 uh, be killed. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to resurrect. He didn't even didn't see the need to go on too much about the sin side of things. Sin didn't seem to worry Jesus as much as it seemed to worry all his religious followers. Again, I'm not saying no. I'm not saying sin is fine. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Sin separated us from God. That makes sin bad. It separated us from God. It was part of the barrier between us. So sin is not a good thing. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying though is, if our whole Christianity revolves around sin and sin management, and looking at sin, and picking out sin, and we're, we're missing the main point, which is resurrection life. Life walking daily with the Spirit of God as, as his bride, as his people, as his ambassadors. God gives us the opportunity for a fresh start, or to hit that reset button. You know, I had an interesting um, moment with my son, Jonathan, many, many, many years ago. Jonathan and one of his little mates, Elijah, I took them fishing, and Johnny, they would have only been about this big, right? Really, really small, young. And uh, it was, you know where Fishery Creek Bridge is in Ballina? You know, the, as you go into Ballina, you go over, and there's the, the little um, boat ramp there and so on. There, there's a, a little jetty. They just put the jetty in there. And, and, and I took Johnny and his mate Elijah fishing one day. So we're down there, and, uh, of course, I'm, I love fishing, and I've got some, you know, my fishing gear is pretty good gear. I like to look after it and, you know, save up for the better stuff if I can. And so uh, they didn't have rods. So I've got one rod for me. I've got one fishing rod for Elijah and one fishing rod for Johnny. Now, when I got there, I only gave them one instruction. That's it. Sounds a lot like the Garden of Eden, really, when I think about it. One, one rule and you can't do it. One rule. I said, here's the deal. While we're fishing, once I cast it out for you, you're not allowed to just put your rod down and walk away from it because you know what's going to happen. Something's going to grab it, boom, and my rod's gone in the river and so on. So do you hear me, boys? They went, yeah, 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 we get it. So I bait up uh, Elijah and I cast it out. And Elijah's standing there doing the right thing. I get Johnny's. I put a thing, I cast it out. And Johnny's standing there doing the right thing. And I'm about to, to cast mine out. And uh, as I did, Elijah's rod starts going bang, bang. And he hooks onto this thing and he's struggling to bring it in. So I walk over and I grab Elijah's rod. I said, pass it here, mate. And, and anyway, wind and wind and wind. And next thing you know, I hear this voice just to the side of me. What do you reckon it is, Dad? And I turned around and looked and here's Johnny. And I look over there and there's the fishing rod just sitting on. And as I looked at the rod, the tip of the rod went chick, chick, boom, and took off into the river. And I was ropeable. The, the rod's just sitting. It's like the fish was teasing me. It's just sitting on the surface like this, just out of reach. So I started stripping down. I, it must have looked terrible to the cars going over the, the, the road there. I'm stripping down to my underpants to dive in to grab this thing. And just when I got down to my underpants, what do you think happened? Chick, boom, it just disappeared. Gone. And I'm standing there in my underpants and I turned to Jonathan. I said, Jonathan, do you realise what you've done? That was my good fishing rod. I gave you one rule. I just said, don't put it down and you put it down. And I started to lose my marbles at my poor kid, you know. And while I'm getting more and more frantic and angry, I looked down at him and the ears went down like the puppy dog and the, Dad, I'm sorry. And I realised, oh, hang on, pull up. What are you doing? You know, it's a fishing rod at the end of the day. You know, it's not the end of the world. And so I had this amazing moment of being like Jesus. And I turned to Jonathan and I said, you know what, Johnny? It's okay, I forgive you. It's just a fishing rod. And then he goes, okay, can I use your rod now and have it? What? Don't you realize what you've done, Jonathan? And I ramped up again and, you know. And so I was like, no, if you realize what you did, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just move on. You'd camp there and you'd be angry and frustrated. I want you to feel it. I want you to mull it over inside. I want you to process it. I want you to know how bad you've been. But when I said to him, it's okay, I forgive you, he literally took me at my word and moved on as if it hadn't happened. Unbelievable. What a cheeky kid. 
And I flared up about it, thinking he was doing something wrong. And I realized in that moment, what he was doing was 100% right. What he was doing was what most of us as Christians fail to be able to do when our father says, your sins are dealt with, you're forgiven. And we go, okay, and we move on. We want to punish ourselves. We want to beat ourselves up. We want to climb the religious ladder. We want to prove to God that we agree with you, God, yes. We agree that it's really, really bad. I agree so much, God, that I'm just not even going to pray for three days because I don't deserve to be near you, Lord. I'm not going to ask you for anything, Father, because I know that was bad. And I'm going to have a seven-day break from petitioning you and asking for anything. I'm not going to come to the throne of grace because I, you know, I, I'm going to slink away and I'm just going to prove that I agree with you, God, that I'm such a bad person. And that was so evil. When, when God's saying, you know, and I dealt with it. I dealt with it on Friday. Sunday, I just want to give you life. I want you to believe what I say to you when I say you are forgiven. I want you to believe me when I say that there's no more sacrifice necessary for sins. What happened on Friday was the penultimate sacrifice in the economy of God. Spiritually, you are forgiven. Now what I want you to do is stop focusing in on all that stuff. I want you to start embracing life and walking and enjoying life with me. Amen? That's what Resurrection Sunday reminds me of. Is that it's not just about sin. And... and, and If all we do is make it about sin, I don't want to be part of the church. <laughs> I feel bad enough about my own life as it is without constantly <laughs> hanging around a bunch of people that are going to help me refocus on everything that I do bad and wrong. I want life. And life abundantly. And I deserve it. Not because I'm great. Not because of anything good I've done. I deserve it because of what Jesus Christ did for me 2,000 years ago. It doesn't matter what value you think I might have. Somebody died for me. I can't think of any higher price that you would pay for another human being. Greater love is no man than this than you lay down your life. Death of Jesus dealt with sin. It also was a value add to all of humanity. This is how much you mean to me. And now that I've got your attention, I don't want to keep you bogged down in this issue of sin. Now that I've got your attention, I want to lead you. I want to take you into this thing called newness of life. I want to give you a new life. I don't know where you stand with your relationship with Jesus this morning. I know on Easter Sunday, it's, it's funny, Easter Sunday and Christmas, people come to churches that would never, ever go to church any other time of their life. I, I don't get it because I was not brought up at all in a religious setting and um, there was nothing in me that thought on Easter or Christmas, let's go to a church service. But I'm glad people do. I'm glad people do come along because it's an opportunity for you to hopefully hear the story of the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know where your heart is, but can I just encourage you this morning? If you do not know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, would you consider even, even just opening up your mouth and speaking to heaven and saying, God, if you're really there, would you show me? God, if you're really there, would you show me? We do have this historical moment that's been recorded called the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It's there. It's a historical thing. It's not a Bible thing. It's a history thing. That happened. The resurrection bit, we believe. Some people might not. But the whole Jesus story is real. And it's so important that if he is the most significant figure in human history, which I believe that he is, and I'm not talking that from a biblical perspective, these guys at the time that wrote this probably had no idea about the incredible significance and the global impact that Jesus would have and, 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 and all the stuff, the way the world would change because of this man. They probably didn't fully grasp it all. But we do now. And if you're here and you've never really thought about that, can I encourage you? This weekend, think about Jesus. Think about the stories you've heard. Think about the people that you know that have committed their lives to Jesus. Go and ask them the question, why did you do that? What do you get out of this? What's the point? Can you explain it to me? Go and ask the questions. If you're here this morning and maybe you once did walk really closely with God, maybe you've turned away, maybe you've, you've taken your foot off the pedal, maybe life has thrown things at you, maybe culture has, maybe you've got caught up in a whole bunch of other things and your passion for God has just got to the point now where you're like, eh, take it or leave it. I wanted to encourage you that God has a great plan for your life, he really does. And God has life, he wants to give you life. But you need to participate with him. You need to get on the journey with him. You need to walk with him. You need to accept. So if you partake in what Jesus did on Friday, if you acknowledge that he died for my sins, then I now have the right to partake in what he did on Sunday, which is receive resurrection life in me as well. Can I encourage you this weekend, when you go from here and you have your hot cross buns and stuff, 
would you just think about the reality of Jesus Christ? What better weekend to do that than the Easter weekend, amen? Just close your eyes. I want to pray for you. Lord, we want to thank you for uh, this morning. God, thank you for the death of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you dealt with the sin issue. Yes, we still sin, yet we still fall short. But God, you know that. You're aware of that. You knew there was nothing we could do. That's why you did what you did through Jesus on the cross. But Father, I want to also thank you for Sunday. I want to thank you for resurrection life. I want to thank you, God, for the promise that we too can walk in newness of life. We can walk in a new way because of what you did, Lord, because of your resurrection, we too will be resurrected eternally. One day we will go on forever with you. But even now, God, this side of heaven, we can walk in newness of life because of that moment, Lord. And God, I just pray for each person here, God. Father, if if there are people here that don't know you, then God, you are big enough to reveal yourself to them. You did it to me at 19. I pray, God, would you speak to their hearts? Would you show yourself to them? God, would you show them how special they are to you? Show them that you love them, God, that you have a plan and a purpose for their life, God. A plan and a purpose that is way better than any plan and purpose they might come up with for themselves. And Lord, if there are people here this morning and uh, maybe our passions waned a little bit, God, maybe our uh, commitment to you, God, we've taken the foot off the pedal a little bit, God, we've, we've, we've allowed things to get in there and we're not running after and running in that newness of life, God. We know, we know, God, that we're getting caught up and sideswiped and taken away and there are uh, uh, weights and things that are slowing us down and pulling us back. Lord, I pray for them this morning, God, would you just encourage them with this picture of a brand new life, encourage them with a picture of uh, resurrection life, God, for them. What does it look like for them? That, that God, for them too, you have a plan and you have a purpose, God, and it's a great plan and a great purpose. You're doing wonderful things. And you're throwing out opportunities to us to join you in that, Father. And Lord, finally, we want to thank you collectively as a church for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you, God, as Paul said, if that didn't happen, then we've just wasted an hour and a half of our life. But Father, I believe with all my heart, as to many in this room, that it did happen. And God, we thank you for that, Father, this morning. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Hey, there's hot cross buns there. Again, can I encourage, if you feel like God's speaking to you, for me, sometimes that feels like a little unsettling in my belly, and it's, it's, it's a good unsettling. But there's something going on. If you feel like the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you this morning, please don't leave without grabbing somebody. You might have come with somebody, or you might want to grab a complete stranger. Just go and have a chat with someone. Hey, here's what I feel like God was saying to me. Would you pray for me? Or here's a question I've got. Could you answer it? Can we do that? Bless you guys.